we have two uh, items to workshop tonight. One, which is uh, Pipe Assure's contract zone, and the second one will be contract zone for the Army National Guard. We'll start with Pipe Assure's first, and Dan has a quick introduction. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thought it would be worth um, highlighting the differences between the two applications before you tonight. Uh, one is a contract zone amendment. That's the matter that you're going to discuss first, the Piper Shores uh, proposal. And so this workshop is set up to be kind of a, an informal step. Um, it's a voluntary step by Piper Shores. They're going to orient you to what they're thinking in terms of a contract zone amendment to potentially expand their campus. Um, and there's no action the council needs to take on this particular workshop. You can provide feedback to them, direction to them, but there's no formal vote that's necessary. What they'll do after this workshop is sometime in the future they'll, they'll apply to the council and start with a first reading and then a planning board public hearing. Your, your typical uh, legislative process for, for a zoning amendment. Um, that's how a contract zone amendment is, is handled. Uh, the other item, the UNE Army uh, National Guard proposal, is a formal action that you'll be taking at your 7 o'clock meeting. Um, the first step of a new contract zone application is the joint meeting of the, the Planning Board and the Council. You'll have a public hearing and um, have an opportunity for the Planning Board and Council to provide input uh, to their zoning, their contract zone application. And they are going to be looking for um, definitive direction from the Council on on whether that contract zone should move forward. So they're a little bit different. One's an amendment, one's a, a new contract zone. I just wanted to highlight the, those differences before this evening began. Do we have a public hearing at this number one? The first issue, do we have a public no. hearing? No, it, this is a workshop, town council workshops. We don't have public hearing. The public can um, be heard during the uh, half an hour um, you know, Seven. before we get into council business during the okay. uh, um, citizen get up and speak during the public hearing um, portion. So, Jim, I think yep. we're... Okay, thank you. Um, we thank you for the opportunity to share a vision for the possible future of Piper Shores. I'm the CEO of Piper Shores, Jim Adamovich. Um, we are, as a community, pleased to be a member of the, the greater Scarborough community. We view ourselves as a good corporate citizen, a good employer, and hopefully a good neighbor. At present, Piper Shores is the sixth largest employer in the town, and we are the highest taxpayer in the, Scarborough, the town of Scarborough. Uh, we're here today to share with you and to seek your feedback concerning a preliminary future vision for the Piper Shores organization. Um, we believe over the past 13 years that we've really had a, a truly remarkable positive impact on the lives of seniors, on the lives of uh, employees working in Piper Shores, and hopefully on the town of Scarborough. Our organization at present serves more than 300 seniors, and they derive support from 200 part-time and full-time staff, many who live and support the town of Scarborough. Piper Shores is currently configured as follows. The campus in total is a 138-acre property. Of that 138 acres, 96 acres are restricted due to an existing conservation easement. We remain at present Maine's only life care, continuing care retirement community. So we are really a unique organization, not only in the, the greater Scarborough area, but in the state as well. The community itself consists of 160 apartments. There are 40 cottages. We currently operate 40 health center skilled nursing facility beds and 20 assisted living accommodations. We are serving seniors today from the low 60s to 104 years of age. And I might note that that 104 year old lives in an apartment. <laughs> Our services are so popular at present that we currently have a wait list for prospective independent living residents of 85 parties. These are individuals who have a 10% deposit down on a total entrance fee 
that is in the several hundred thousand dollar range. Some of the accommodations that we have wait lists uh, names at present may require a seven plus year wait in order to move to Piper Shores. The community, we believe, has a very strong base, a financial base. We were recently rated by Fitch uh, as A-, minus, which is among the strongest ratings in our industry nationally. Why have we asked for your valuable time this evening? We believe that Piper Shores over the past 13 years has identified a need to evolve and we would like to do this in a way that serves both current and future generations of Piper Shores residents in the Scarborough community. <clears throat> we are seeing greater demand for supportive services within the community, whether that is assisted living or skilled care or uh, home care services as well. We're also seeing greater demand for memory support. You may know that more familiarly as Alzheimer's care or dementia care. We see a much greater demand on the community today for assisted living, which is a level of care that supports individuals with activities of daily living needs. We also, as I referenced previously, see a great interest in independent living and a growing interest in this area. At present, our community on the independent living side is currently sold out. Nationally, the occupancy rates are around 91 to 92%. So I think we can clearly demonstrate that the Piper Shores model is working and being very effective in serving seniors in this marketplace. Finally, we're on the cusp of the greatest demographic change that our nation will ever experience, which is the aging of the baby boomers. We have not yet begun to see the baby boomers age in a meaningful way, but over the next 20 to 30 years, there will be profound impact on society nationally and locally as the baby boomers continue to age and plan for their retirement. We would like to ask for your feedback and input as consideration is given to a multi-phase plan that we think makes sense for the present and the future of Piper Shores a plan that we think makes sense for the citizens of Scarborough and for seniors throughout the, re the region who are demanding high quality care and service. We have among our Piper Shores planning team uh, this evening uh, Ron Epstein who is legal counsel to Piper Shores. We also have Drew Kepley who is providing architectural services and Mike Tatamo Wieland who is with S FST providing civil engineering support services, and I would like to ask Ron to share a few words regarding the contract zoning agreement process. Good evening. I'm Ron Epstein from Jensen Baird in Portland, uh, and I'd like to briefly review the history of the contract zone and what's uh, our preliminary thoughts in terms of what we would like to propose for an amendment. In November 1997, Piper Shores and the town entered a contract zone agreement. That agreement permits to be constructed what essentially has been constructed to date. Uh, the 160 independent living apartments that are in the main lodge at the end of Piper Road. Uh, the 40 independent living cottages that are on Sedigan Lane, which comes off of Piper Road, and 20 assisted living units, and 40 skilled nursing units, both of which are in the health center, which is connected by a bridge to the, what I call the main lodge at the end of Piper Road. Uh, so the zoning does not permit any expansion. However, in the 17 years since this agreement was, has entered, the nature of what uh, residents expect and what is the state of art in life care communities has changed somewhat. There is a, a real demand and need for, for memory care, dementia care, Alzheimer's care. Uh, there's a need for additional assisted living. And so, as you'll see in the slideshow about to be shown, the initial proposal, really the immediate proposal, is to add 12 beds 
of memory care units and 16 beds of other assisted living. All 28 of those units would be licensed as assisted living. Uh, so that, that really is an immediate plan. However, when we started to talk to staff of the town, they said, gee, you know, it's probably not a great idea to, to submit this and then keep coming back for additional amendments, and they knew we were in the midst of a long-range planning process. And so we really, the rest of uh, what Drew Kepley will present by way of a slideshow shows some conceptual plans of how Piper Shores might also expand over the, over the long term. Um, I do have here tonight, and I'll uh, leave with, I guess, uh, Dan Bacon, uh, 15 copies of a revised First Amendment. The amendment that was included in your package contained uh, one error in terms of the square footage footprint uh, maximum that would be proposed, and so we're submitting that correction. Uh, and we also recognize that uh, this is really just a preliminary step, a workshop. Uh, we, we hope to get some preliminary comment from the council. We recognize that there's not been any public hearing yet. We intend, we fully intend before uh, a formal presentation of the council that a neighborhood meeting will be held. And of course, this, this meeting is, will also be disseminated. And uh, so we hope to, to, to start a discussion as to uh, what the nature of the plans uh, will be. Thank you. I'm Drew Kepley from SFCS Architects, and I'll just, uh, as way of introduction to the, to the show, orient you to the site. Uh, if everybody can, to the front slides here. This is the Piper Shore site. Many of you will recognize that, but the main building is down here next to the ocean, and uh, the these, this wooded area is actually in a conservation easement, and. Uh, predominant area in that easement is wetlands and is undisturbed and uh, also is a buffer here for the existing cottages. So those are Piper Shore cottages. And uh, so you get a sense of the lay of the land there and, and what the site really looks like. It's a beautiful site and uh, it's got a lot of really great natural features. Um, That just gives you an aerial photograph of the actual main buildings down by the uh, the ocean, and just as way of uh, orientation, the ocean's to the left. This is the independent living, and the Holbrook building back here, which houses the assisted living and the skilled nursing component. The main master plan elements that we're we're looking at are. Or there's really several. The main one is the Holbrook repositioning, if you will, which is a combination of renovations and expansions. Uh, the, the expansion we're looking at is 12 beds of memory care, 16 beds of social model assisted living, and some upgrades to existing operations, including renovations to the skilled nursing, uh, one wing of the skilled nursing to eight beds of uh, additional memory care. We envision that to be phase one the, the main phase that, that we're looking to do as soon as possible. And then as a, as a future phase, one of the things we're considering or like to consider is the development of a site on the northeast part of the a parcel for independent living uh, in, in a blend of different amenity type uh, or, or, or uh, occupancies. By that I mean apartments and duplexes and uh, single family homes. And then there's several other smaller components an arts building, some dining enhancements and wellness. And uh, in, in the future, uh, looking long range, we're thinking that possibly the nursing home and the assisted living might want to be redeveloped in the future. So we've also looked at that as something that might be done in, in the very distant future. <clears throat> so just to give you a, a view of the, of the site plan, uh, we looked at the aerial photograph. Here's the main building and the ocean to the bottom of the page. Uh, this is the Holbrook building in the back. Our first phase that we're like to consider is, is in addition to the Holbrook building for assisted living and associated parking. And the second uh, or future phase of independent living on this northeast property here 
is, uh, is something we'd also like uh, to consider. And the future phases, or the future phase that I mentioned for the uh, healthcare repositioning would be adjacent to Holbrook and the, the new in assisted living wing. So just to orient you on Holbrook, this is their this is a three-story building. The first, the first level has parking. The second level is skilled nursing, and the third floor is a social model assisted living. And the first uh, component of the master plan that, that we're looking at is in addition to this building, and we're looking at adding it on this north wing in, in a certain configuration that would respect the existing parking and also tie into the existing buildings to facilitate uh, ease of staffing and, and some other uh, beneficial layouts. And this is a site plan. What we were just looking at is the roof of this building here in Tan, and this orange building is what we're proposing in plan. So it would span the parking, and the first level would be parking in this new plan, and then the second level would be uh, assisted living memory care, and then the third floor would be social model assisted living. So that's the first, uh, that's what we consider the first phase. Um, and as far as a future phase, as I mentioned before, we envision some sort of building to be constructed over this existing parking on this side and tying back to the existing Holbrook wing here, maintaining this existing courtyard. And uh, one of the benefits of this is that it keeps the uh, service uh, and efficiencies of staff intact. And I think one of the other things we're striving to do is create a household model, which has been beneficial in the care of uh, dementia residents and skilled nursing residents. And just another view of the Holbrook building and what I'm going to show you here is an addition. You can see the north wing here and then this, this artist's conception of what that might, that new building might look like, which is this building. So just to orient you, you see these arched windows here on the existing north wing. Those are here and so we're proposing this three-story building. And I think what this is just trying to convey is that the scale would be very similar in terms of the heights and the roof lines. And architecturally, the windows would be of similar scale, the roof pitches, the, the design of the, the siding, the trim, those sorts of things would be in keeping with the architecture of Park Piper Shores. For the northeast site, this is just to orient you again. This is Piper Road. The ocean is to the bottom of the page. And the existing cottage drive is here. These are the existing Piper Shore cottages. And so in this particular plan, which we've worked closely with FST on and, and some of the other team members on, is to is to have possibly a two-phase development, which would this this shows a full the full uh, implementation, but we envision this to be two phases. One would be kind of this northern portion of the tract, uh, which would house um, small apartment buildings with four to eight units, duplex units, and then a community building, which would have possibly a wellness component, maybe a small dining element, and some other support spaces, and probably in the order of uh, 26 to 28 units being built in the first phase. And then in the second phase to the south here, another 26 to 28 units for a total of 52 units at, at the end of the, the end of the build out. And as you can see, it, it connects back to the existing uh, cottage road. And just to give you an idea of the sense of the, the scale of that, so we envision the community center here, the smaller units in single family homes, the duplexes, small apartment buildings, maybe there's a little cul-de-sac or, or circular drive for some duplexes, and then another small apartment building. So this future phase will then come down to the south. And just as a summary of the overall build-out that, that we are looking at is, is nine duplex buildings, two units per site for a total of 18, two single-family homes, four four-unit buildings for a total of 16 units, and those we envision to be uh, three stories with parking on the first level and two levels of, of apartments above. And the same for the uh, two eight-unit buildings would be parking on the first floor and then two levels of apartments above for a total build-out of 52 units. The Commons building we envision is five to six or 7,000 square feet with the dining, the wellness, and, and other support spaces. 
and of course there's some there are already existing walking trails and uh, we would seek to maintain and enhance those and also add some additional outdoor amenities as part of that development. And this is this is a, a photograph of a, a project that's uh, similar to what we're proposing. It has the parking, you can see individual garage doors and then the individual apartments above. This gives you the character and the scale of what we're proposing and then uh, an artist rendering of a possible duplex configuration uh, with the uh, garages and and of course we would study s some indigenous architecture, main architecture to try to uh, complement the existing architecture of Piper Shores for instance and then play off of some of the uh, distinctive architecture around the area. And just, just to go back to the site plan to just kind of reiterate where we were. So we're first phase, the assisted living added onto Holbrook, the north wing of Holbrook. Uh, the northeast site development here, possibly built in two phases, the north phase, the north phase and the south phase. And then a, a long term plan to build some possibly a health care uh, renovation or excuse me, health health care replacement as uh, as things um state of the art changes and evolves that, that might be necessary in the future. So we've we've looked at that as well. And just a really rough timeline, so we look to next month to possibly submit the formal contract zone amendment to the council. In November, working through with the team and, and the council, we hope to get approval of that zoning amendment. And if, if that is approved, we would uh, begin design of the Holbrook Assisted Living Edition, phase one, possibly by the end of this year, maybe the first of next year. And then um, in January through April for uh, site approval process with the uh, planning board and then possibly summer of 2015 for the start of construction for the Holbrook assisted living. And I'll end with the site plan. Thank you. Okay, with that, I believe I forgot to mention before the meeting that it was a joint workshop between the um, Town Council and the Planning Board. So I see a lot of Planning Board members here. Um, so we'll start the discussion with uh, one a Planning Board member. Mm -hmm. Susan. Why not? Okay, is that good enough? Okay. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about why I hate contract zones but I hate contract zones. Moving right along. One of the problems is that things like this can happen and we deal with a piece and then another piece comes along and another piece comes along and it gets dealt with by different people in different places at different times and I think that's problematic and I think that what we're talking about here is a perfect example of the fact that we're talking about phase one and phase two and I'd like to think that we can take a look at them as a as a board and as a council as a joint thing. That's background. I have no problems with phase one at all and I think it's um, a testimony to the fact that what Piper Shores is doing is needed and successful and it's being done well and it's an, it's an advantage to the community and we're lucky to have you and I have no problems with that and I'm sure you'll do a beautiful job of it. Proposed phase two, however, is something that not only can I not get excited about, I think it's a deal breaker because that is a conservation easement and we worked long and hard to get this thing done in such a way that it preserved this open space. I'm not even going to bother to go through what I think is going to be the long process that you'd have to do in order to get that conservation easement changed. I do know that the council would have to vote for it and then it would have to go to probably the Department of Environmental Protection. And then it would end up probably in the Attorney General's office. And if at that point it's still alive, I can guarantee you that every conservation group in mm. the state and maybe New England is going to get together and take it back to court. So my question is whether, I mean, A, I think it's a very bad idea. 
if it succeeds, what it will do is take all the teeth out of an incredibly good tool for planning, and I'm on the planning board, so I'm interested in planning. Town of Scarborough has a very, very strong reputation <coughs> as being conservation-minded. So you take the teeth out of a tool that is used for conserving open space and preserving natural beauty and wetlands and all that stuff. And if that succeeds here, it will lose the teeth every place else. Nobody else is going to use it. You might just as well put it in the box and put it away because it's not working. So uh, that having been said, I really would like to encourage the uh, council when they get to the point of actually in, you know, getting a chance to look at the finer details of this to consider the, the power of what that involves. And the rest of it I don't have any problems with. I would like to suggest, however, that that either is a matter of the applicant saying, okay, forget phase two. We'll call phase two the long range thing about what to do with the nursing home and we'll just do this part. But if they have to if they if we're gonna keep on trying to do phase two, then phase one and phase two need to be done together. Thank you very much. Councilor Hobart. <clears throat> I just wanted to make sure that I got out of the gate saying two quick things. The first one is my last name is Holbrook, and no, there is no affiliation. <laughs> so I, I just want to um, kind of maybe throw that out there, or at least to my knowledge, there is none. So, um, so there is no conflict, I swear. Um, I also wanted to maybe let out of the gates that um, I was approached a year ago to meet with this. I think it was a year ago. Time's starting to slip me. Um, for just a, a, a kind of touch base meeting because I was a counselor. Of course, I do and have worked for a number of years as my time here through um, Housing Alliance, which addresses housing needs and, and that sort of thing. So I was approached maybe a year ago or so about um, Piper Shores in particular. Um, so again, just for disclosure purposes, I was asked as a counselor to just to kind of, you know, kick it around and what were some thoughts that I had from that perspective, one as a counselor and two as a housing need. Um, so again, those are my disclosures, if I will. So now I'd like to add my two cents, which is the same kind of two cents that I had at the time which is as far as the skilled care and the assisted living and, and before I became a hairstylist, I thought I wanted to do nursing and kudos to the folks that do, but it was not for me. But the greatest lesson I learned is what a huge demand and need that is. Those skilled care facilities are not something that are in abundance. And as our population gets older, it certainly does become a huge necessity. So from that perspective, I certainly um, applaud it. I have no issue with it as a counselor to amend them to allow the skill care. Um, I was, at the time, I don't think we were talking 15 acres. I think that it was a thought of maybe five. Um, I'm not necessarily hung up with it either way. However, um, it was my thought then, and it is still my thought now, that Again, it meets a specific need within this community as far as it's an interesting concept. It's one that's unique for Scarborough, which is your loved one who may need highly skilled care and your ability to live within a very close proximity to that person. That is also a huge problem we have here, that your loved one might need care and you're 50 miles away. Um, I could support it with a little different concept, which is I would be willing to po allow and, and support taking portion of this property out of conservation with perhaps a very nice donation towards conservation somewhere else so that we have something similar somewhere that's maintained in conservation Maybe it's somewhere else in town, but we've lost no ground on the fact of tangible area conserved. Um, I'm going to throw an absolutely cockamamie number out there, which is, um, and I'm not saying this is what it needs to be, but, but certainly, you know, if this were house lots, there's a value there. And what would that be? You know, I know certainly in my neck of the woods, a house lot is worth 100000 Well, what's a house lot worth here? You know, 
that type of money towards a conservation effort somewhere else achieves the same goal and, and achieves some of the same purposes for what I think would be a unique opportunity for Scarborough. So that's my input for it. Okay. Um, Ron. Um, I guess I'm not quite sure how many acres of the conservation land would be taken. Um, I, I don't have that number exactly at my fingertips. So can somebody fill me in? Yeah, thanks. I'm Mike Tatama Wheeland. I'm an engineer with FST. Uh, and to answer your question, uh, there isn't a definitive proposal out there yet, but what's shown on uh, the materials that we've presented here is approximately 15 acres. So it is the 15 acres. Yeah, it would come out. And uh, let me touch a little bit on, on uh, Ms. Holbrook's comments as well. Um, the process is is sort of a, a great process in order to uh, remove this from the the, uh, the conservation easement, this area from the conservation easement, uh, and certainly it, it's going to include mitigation. We're working uh, sort of internally to try to come up with a process to put together a mitigation package. Um, we've certainly spoken to the town about it. Uh, and we've we've talked to other groups in in town as well. Uh, DEP will be involved. Uh, the attorney general may be involved. So that's a that's probably going to be a lengthy process. I think what uh, what we're asking of the council is to amend the contract zone to allow sort of the the number of units that is shown on the plan, understanding that a whole separate process is going to have to be undertaken in order to remove some of this land from the conservation easement. So I, they, they, aren't, they aren't necessarily going hand in hand, so a, a sort of a favorable uh, I amendment. I think my point is they need to go hand in hand. I, I guess that that is mm -hmm. what I was trying to express, that they really ought to. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Yeah. <coughs> Actually, the law requires that they go hand in hand. The, what the law says is no land can be taken out of conservation unless Piper Shores pays the value to it of taking that land out. And so there would be an appraisal process at some point that would, that would set the value of that land. Uh, the other thing worth mentioning is this 15-acre site, which Mike can elaborate on, has almost no wetlands. So it was really, while the major, while almost every other acre that's within the conservation easement is wetlands, uh, this this is a uh, an area that I think was really over included because it's really all dry upland. I have another question. Well, one of you, how contiguous is this to the neighbors? There's some high value homes contiguous to Piper Shores and and you're pushing, how close are you going to be coming to those homes? I, I think we'll be very conscious of that in meetings with the neighbors to make sure that there's, uh, that we don't get too close and that there's appropriate landscaping screening, either by preserving existing or, or planting new. Uh, but that's uh, really what this is, is sort of a preliminary concept to just get the discussion started, and, th and that's something that we certainly would be very mindful of as we got into further detail. Okay, so you haven't had any neighborhood meetings yet? No, we intend to, ha following this meeting, we intend to schedule a neighborhood meeting before we come back to the council to, uh, to, to really continue the discussion. And my last question is, and um, trying to get a configuration, and you keep growing, and I, I understand the need, uh, is it going to get to the point where there's such congestion that emergency vehicles are going to have a tough time? Well, with respect to the assisted living, nursing, uh, assist nursing care units, and uh, assisted living, so the memory care, assisted living, and nursing homes, those really will have only incremental traffic from additional staffing, uh, and uh, so uh, the, the residents of those units are uh, not likely to drive. Uh, 
Um, the independent living units would have some, and we certainly, it's, uh, you know, I think this process is a zoning process. It doesn't guarantee approval, and those parking and traffic type issues are things, I guess, that I respectfully suggest would be considered in, in great detail by the planning board before any approval were given, but we're certainly open to uh, including them. Uh, we've done some analysis of uh, traffic and, and parking, and, and certainly we'll be doing that in much greater detail as this process continues. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ron, um, Ron did you... Is did you get a clear answer to your first question? Did you think? Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, right, thanks. <clears throat> Next. Councilor Katarina. Um, I agree with Councilor Holbrook in the fact that obviously this type of housing is, is needed, particularly dementia housing. I had a parent that I had to place in dementia housing and trying to find placement is next to impossible. And I was extreme, I was very surprised to find out that in this uh, continuum of care system at Piper Shores, there was nothing for memory care. So in that respect, I think that the plan here is, is very good. I have concerns about removing uh, the conservation easement portion. And my there's two things. One of my questions is, and I, it was a long time ago, and I was raising a young child at the time, so I wasn't paying close attention. but. Um, why was this put into conservation easement to begin with? I'd like to know that, um, and what would be the impact of removing it. Uh, and then the second um, thing that I would like to see happen is that anything that's planned here, I'd like to see it reviewed by the Conservation Commission. Um, and I, that may or may not be required, but I'd like to see it as part of it, just as another set of eyeballs looking at anything that's done. So. Well, that, that makes sense. We would consult with them for their opinion. Right. So just to preliminary answers to those questions, why the conservation easement? Yeah. It, it really identifies uh, two primary characteristics, preservation of the wetlands. So as I say, this one area is, is, is not wetlands, uh, whereas the majority of the remaining land is. And it also, uh, there's a network of walking trails that were created, right. and those will be preserved also. Well, uh, well and, and, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but, but specifically at the time, there was a reason why all of this land was put into a conservation easement and not set aside for future Expansion. Right, and, and I sat through many of those hearings. Uh, the 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 gist of it was is that we were trying to protect the wetlands and preserve public access to the site. Uh, there had been historic access along the Kings Highway, along the ocean, but also a number of people walked through some trails that were within the woods, and mm -hmm. those were have been enhanced by Piper Shores with some bridges over some wetlands and things like that. I've been on those trails. Yeah. Yeah. And then on the Conservation Commission, Mike has reached out to them uh, really primarily because we wanted to start the discussion of, how, of what the funds might be used for if this change were to be uh, approved because we would be paying for the value of that. And we know the town has the Benjamin Farm uh, project. Uh, but we, we really reached out to see if there are other projects, and I think their response was essentially that, uh, that the Benjamin Farm is their priority right now. They know that there are others that they have looked at, but they really haven't ranked those. Mm -hmm. I, I I, I'm on the Conservation okay. Commission, no. but I don't remember seeing or hearing no. about it, any yeah, think you, I think there's some confusion. You're referring yeah. to the Scarborough Land Trust. Oh, okay. okay. Oh, I'm sorry. No, this I is, yeah, I was, okay, yeah, I was going to say, well. no. Okay. So it's okay. the, la the Land Trust that was reached out. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, I have a, a question uh, regarding the second phase and how you uh, came about with the number of units and design. Were you were you attempting to maximize the space that you thought you could use, or is the number of units that are in there based upon your research, what you financially think you can sustain as an organization? What I'm asking is, if it was half that size, would you still pursue it? 
It's an excellent question, and as we looked at the site, the charge that was given to the design team was to look at the, in this case, about 15 acres and try to identify the number of dwelling units that the acreage could support. Um, that would reflect the maximum number of acre or the maximum number of dwelling units that we think that the site could support. Because this planning effort was really looking to support the contract zoning revision process, we wanted to provide the maximum number of, of units to be incorporated into the document, whether in reality that number may in fact be lower. I, I think it's entirely possible that the unit count can certainly be reduced. And do you know um, off the top of your head as far as capacity, um, this might be more for Jay, whether or not adding these units would um, conflict with current um, residential standards w as far as density goes? It, it would be part of the contract zone? Is that yeah, the question yeah. that you're asking is in terms of net residential density that we typically deal with when we see a subdivision. Right. Um, I haven't seen what those numbers are. I would certainly imagine that the existing number of units exceeds what the net residential density would allow. So really it's a function of the contract zone and what ultimately the council and board fi are comfortable with fitting on the site. Um, yeah, I would be. I guess I would probably be curious to see how it compares to a, a standard development as far as what we're doing in density-wise in there. But that's, I guess, that's a topic for another night. That, that's all I have. Thank you. Sure, Alan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, trying to address some of that, I was actually making notes, uh, Mr. McGee, regarding some of that in terms of my comments, um, which I'll address in a second. But the first thing I want to do is I want to. Um, express some gratitude to the team because one of the first things I heard them say was that they would be interested in doing neighborhood meetings, mm -hmm. which I think is absolutely essential before this project goes much further, that they solicit input from the neighborhood uh, to try to get some feedback there. Um, <clears throat> having said that, I can also say, and without going into a lot of great detail, <coughs> One of the reasons why I'm not a major fan of contract zones either is because we allow certain things in contract zones that we would probably never allow anywhere else in town. And, and to try to stress that fact and to address Mr. McGee's comment, um, the underlying zoning for this area is RF. In the RF zone, there's only one unit allowed per two acres. Mm -hmm. We're looking at a piece of property at this point where they're saying they want to take and remove the conservation easement on roughly 15 acres. If you did the math on that, that would say seven units would be permissible in that same area in a typical RF zone. Um, now if I look at the number of units that they want to put in that 15 acres, and I also consider that they want to add an additional 28 acres onto the existing facility at Holbrook, that's 80 units. 80 units, which normally in an RF zone would require 160 acres, according to our current zoning. That's a pretty significant size piece of property. Um, part of my concern is that we may be building density way out of proportion to the rest of the surrounding area. And is that something that makes a lot of sense to, uh, to our community? And I would ask that the town council consider that in their um, deliberations on this. Um, I am extremely concerned that we're considering a precedence setting breaking of a conservation easement. Mm -hmm. This is precedent setting, right? This is not every day done. I don't know of any instance here in this town where it's been done. And there's been some conversation that it may not have even been done within the state, but I certainly can't go that far, all right? Um, we, as a planning board, spend 
many, many hours talking with developers when they bring conservation subdivisions to us. And the beauty of that is to try to control some of the density of buildings, certainly, but also to preserve land to be used down the road in the future and prevent the traditional sprawl that has overtaken many communities. Um, I think taking that out of, um, out of the hands, if you will, of the ordinances that we have in town um, and the work that's gone in to try to building and developing the, the face of our community, I, I, I really feel that this kind of flies in the face of it. Now, I do appreciate that we do need these types of facilities, and I can tell you that having sat on the planning board when we were talking about the one that's almost across the street, the amount of interest that that garnered and um, the opposition that came as we were trying to put that unit in place here in town. Um, there are, I think, as good if not better places to do this that would be more consistent with our current ordinances. Um, which would be much more consistent with the density that we, we would like to try to see. Um, and so, so I'm struggling with that. And um, again, I, I look at it as 80 units and 15 acres. Wow, that's a lot. Um, I'm not sure how that relates to some of our, um, our other high density communities that we have uh, in terms of Eastern Village and, and the one over in Dunstan. But I don't think the density is even that high in those areas. Um, so, so, so again, I, I have a concern in setting the precedence. I would hate to see us get in a position where we start to compromise our community space um, because we think it's okay to do, you know? I, it, we put a lot of thought and effort into trying to protect and preserve space. I think this flies in the face of that, and for that reason, I would have a difficult time trying to support it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Councilor Holbrook. Uh, I just wanted to touch base on two things, and I, I mean, no disrespect, but I have a humbly different opinion. Um, I don't believe the highest and best use of this space and I don't view it as RF. We're not talking about sewered lots. We're not, ta as far as, you know, we're not talking wells. We're not talking septics. We're talking of a, a unique concept which very much caters to that um, TVC concept where it's town village center. This is a community within itself, within Scarborough. They're using these activities within the site of the campus. They're using, you know, the you know the food hall, the rec halls, the activity halls. These aren't necessarily people, and, and I don't mean to, to begrudge it, but um, this isn't the typical neighborhood traditional development. So I look at it as it more, like I said, as that self-contained, you know, TVC, its own little village that would merit a higher density. Um, I guess I do also just want to comment that I've never, um, I'm, I'm going to pull a Judy Roy comment out of my <laughs> hat, um, which is, you know, no, you, you should never do something with the side of tying the hands of a future council. Your needs will change. Your desires will change. What you're trying to do in the future and isn't necessarily always what you were trying to do mm -hmm. 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so I, I have a little less maybe heartburn with a contract zone because I think that's the point of a contract zone. It allows for flexibility to meet the needs of your current situation rather than tying you into something you absolutely have to do. Um, so again, just my humble disagreement <laughs> on that topic, but um, I'll end it with that. Okay. Anyone else before we go on to the next? Councilor Donovan. Uh, just to pick up on the disclosures, uh, <clears throat> I've spent decades working for uh, retirement communities uh, doing their legal work. So uh, I have a passion for the importance of this as a contribution to our community, and having done it for 40 years. Uh, uh, but <clears throat> uh, at 
the same time, I think when you're in this seat, it's very premature to make judgments, and that's why I think it's better to listen uh, to, to a great degree uh, than, than to speak. I'd like to hear from the neighbors. I'd like to know what the history of the use has been. I'd like to know uh, what the options are about uh, uh, taking monies that might accrue from this, what the economic impact is, what the impact on the, on the neighborhood is. Uh, I will say I was sitting in a uh, very fine uh, retirement community in West Manchester uh, uh, many years ago, and they said in a, it was a large uh, expansion that was proposed, and, uh, and they said, let's do it like the premier facilities in New England. And they ticked those off, and the top of the list was Piper Shores. And that was the first time I'd ever heard the word Piper Shores, and I didn't know where it was or, or, or what it was. But it was, it was remarkable, and now since uh, we've come a long way down the road, I think, uh, with Piper Shores, uh, this facility is not an RF zone. It may still be in there for <coughs> whatever technical reasons, but it is a contained facility, and I think we need to look at it from in that context. But just because we do, and densities may be different, does not change the fact that we cannot allow it to, uh, uh, just because we like the idea of it, allow it to have an adverse impact on uh, its neighbors. That would be unfair, because that, those neighbors, neighborhoods were built up with a certain expectation, and a strong expectation was the conservation easement. So this is, this is a tough one to grapple with, and, and will take a lot of work for us to, to get through and, and reach a fair result. Okay. Dan, one question from you. The um, over by um, coming in to Higgins Beach on the right is a uh, pretty dense uh, amount of condominiums. Mm -hmm. Is that rule Creek. RF? Right. Is that RF or has that been changed, that zoning? No. Um, the, the Higgins Beach neighborhood, the Higgins Beach area, right. is either R3 or R4. There's both zoning districts. Right in Higgins Beach, and what that means is either three units per acre, so you know, 10 to 15,000 uh, square feet per lot, or four units per acre, so 10,000 square foot lots. Um, so that's the zoning specific to Higgins Beach based on uh, the denser development of Higgins Beach. Um, but as has been mentioned, the, the Piper Shores property prior to the contract zone was mostly uh, the rural and farming district. Uh, one unit per two acres has been mentioned. I think maybe a few pieces of it that kind of jut towards Higgins Beach might have been also R3 or R4. I'd have to check. No, um, that's okay. Just rough. So, so, yeah. so to the opposite side of that the uh, uh, would be the few houses and open um, woods and fields. That, that's, that zone would be what? So the, the properties that abut Piper Shores to the south and to the west? There is yes. A, there is a pointer, if that would <coughs> help you. <coughs> Mark this. So I'll turn around. Um, this is Hagen's Beach over here. That's right. Yep. And so most of this land area, like I mentioned, is the higher density residential zones, R3 or R4. The properties to the south, um, which include coal farm estates, uh, large lot development to the south, that is the rural and farming district, mm -hmm. and then properties to the west, across the street, right. uh, across Spurwink Road, are also the rural and farm zone. So that's the, the lay of the land, and also these uh, three or four house lots <coughs> that are right next to the Holbrook facility are, I believe, are also RF. That's why they, there's only three or four houses versus, um, you know, three or four houses on probably two to four acres each. Okay, because so it's sort of a little trans, transitional from, okay. Let's see. All right, that's it. Um, anyone else? Okay. I'm going to move on to the... Uh,
just a final word on timeline. I mean, the last slide talked about it, so I presume uh, you'll take what you've heard this evening, and uh, we'll hear further from you as to whether you want to make come back uh, in a formal capacity. Great. Thank you. Thank gentlemen. you very much for your comments tonight. Yeah, thanks. We might need just a few minutes to switch things. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're going to take a few minutes. Yeah, cause stay here. Don't take off the smoke. Well, I'm not, but I, I use the facilities. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Okay.